Thank you everyone for joining Lumini's webinar, The Great HR Debate, the HR Tech Edition. We'll start, we will start off the debate by sharing the results from Lumini's HR Tech research in which over 200 HR professionals were surveyed. From there, we'll start the debate. And after each debated topic, we will pull you, the audience, to weigh in. So if you have any questions, please hit the QA button and send them in. Afterwards, we will also be sharing a recording and a post-webinar follow-up email. So I'm Brandi Hudson. I'm the moderator today. I have over 17 years of HR experience in every industry, including hospitality, finance, and most recently, high tech. I practice HR in New York at PlayDots and TripleLift, as well as in Southern California and in New Orleans. Um, currently, I'm the community manager for HR4HR.org, a new community for HR professionals, so please come and join us as we'll be launching soon. Mimi, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Mimi, um, and my background is in public health science research um, and then moved into uh, the broker world insurance and now am at Trusted Health. Uh, so lots of uh, movement there, um, but consistently kind of in that healthcare industry area and now in a product company, uh, Trusted Health, we're a healthcare staffing agency, placing nurses and opportunities nationwide. We are the employee of record and looking to provide the best experience possible for our nurses. Um, and we recently went through a massive RFP for a year-end cutover uh, to new payroll and benefits providers. So I'm happy to be here today and share what I can. Awesome, thanks Mimi. Sarah, how about you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brandy. Uh, I've been really looking forward to our discussion. My name is Sarah Weiner, and I'm currently the Benefits Manager at SunPower. We're a global leader in the solar energy industry. Uh, we design, manufacture, install, and perform ongoing maintenance and monitoring to residential, commercial, and utility customers worldwide. And we're looking to change the way the world is powered. I feel really happy working for an organization uh, that has such a strong purpose. Uh, previous to this, I was the, I managed the uh, HRIS benefits, compensation, and payroll for Aspen Heights Partners, a property development, construction, and management company that has built and managed properties across the U.S., uh, traditionally in the student housing space, as well as I've held positions in accounting and software licensing sales. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. And next is going to be Aaron, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at Lumity. We have Aaron here to share some key results from the HR Tech Survey. Thanks, Brandy. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining today. Um, you know, in our HR Tech Survey, as Brandy mentioned, has had over 200 respondents. And it's still open for anyone who has not participated. Um, we will send a copy of the results for the folks that, that do. Um, and I, I just kind of want to frame the debate today. Um, in any good debate, it's always good to be both quantitative and qualitative. Mimi and Sarah are obviously going to be really great on providing their expert opinions on HR tech, um, both of whom have done a ton of research in their roles at many companies um, to make the best decisions given all the factors HR and people people have to weigh. Um, but what I want to really talk about is the quantitative results um, of just a piece of our HR tech survey that will really help frame this debate. And there's clearly some pretty prevailing sentiment in some of these areas. And in others, well, just like in life, it's, it's pretty 50-50. So here are the results of the first sentiment poll. Again, this is pretty broad. Um, but over half of the companies we surveyed were not happy with the current HR tech stack. Um, this could be payroll. It could be benefits administration or HIS. It could be an ATS or a performance management system. Um, it could be something a predecessor put in place and then left, or a system that they've outgrown. It could be the result of a long lead time for integrations, or feeds to be set up, or a lack of internal IT resources to really get it going. Honestly, whatever the reason, the more important focus I really think we should ask ourselves is, what is it that makes you happy with your HR tech stack? Um, and really, one of the best practices I just kind of want to bring up today is really, as you listen to this debate, ask yourself what criteria you personally have. Jot those down. When you're doing your analysis and due diligence, make sure you always have these criteria on hand. Some criteria never change. They're based off of your own personal professional philosophy, um, values of the purpose HR tech should serve within an organization. And some criteria will change depending on your role, the culture of the organization you're currently in. It's just really something to list both of these down before you start your research. Um, so with that said, let's dive into a few of the findings from our sentiment survey. 
So first off here, 45% of employers say employees cannot find what they need with help from HR. So this is pretty evenly split. Um, we actually had a pretty lively debate about this in our last event um, around the prodigious use of internal Slack channels and whether or not HR was um, quote unquote enabling employees as human wikis. I also can't tell you the number of times I've talked to HR folks and tech companies on market research calls that post all HR information to things like Confluence, which is typically a wiki reserved for product and engineering folks. Um, this debate goes really beyond um, what the HR tech culture is. And so what your personal philosophy is on being true being a true service to employees, um, but like anything in life, it can go to extremes. Either employees are completely lost without you or they are too dependent. So what I'd love to get more feedback on at some point is whether this spikes during certain times of the year like open enrollment or the employee life cycle like during onboarding. Next up, 63% of HR practitioners we surveyed use peer recommendations and 51% use online reviews when evaluating new HR tech. Um, I'm just kind of, kind of talking about the two um, most often cited um, questions here around evaluations. Um, I will note conferences here are taking a lower and lower mind share over other avenues. This is something we've noticed as well. If you've ever gone to more than one conference in a year where you had to travel to get there, you'll probably emphasize the fact that it's a lot harder and more crowded these days to get anywhere. Um, you, the buyer purchaser, also have a lot more control today over the process. Again, Slack channels, communities, online review sites like GG Crowd, all great resources. Um, one piece of advice here, again, is to just make sure you have your own list of criteria. Don't answer. Remember, no one understands your situation better than yourself. Um, next up, 63% of employers prefer all one systems over best in class. Um, I'd love to see virtual hand raises here, but I would assume the less resources you have in your team, the more you prefer everything to be integrated together, um, provided those integrations actually work. And I think we've seen a lot of consolidation over the past five years in marketplace. But at the same time, we've also seen the opening up of a lot of application marketplaces, particularly with um, the likes of ADP and Pilosi are both kind of all in one and open a plug-in best of breed. And then we see best of breed vendors like Bamboo HR moving forward towards all-in-one full stack plays um, to own that complete system of record. So this one, I think I'll leave this one up to our panelists to debate and just keep my mouth shut on this one. And when we talk about HR tech, there's a ton of discussion with both with us and a lot of other HR folks on message boards around uh, implementation is so critical in success in knowing what good means relative to your own situation. Team resources and actual technology is just super important. Um, over 70% selected cost of budgetor budgetary restrictions in implementing HR tech and again 40% of our respondents mentioned executive buy-in. Uh, we do know HR typically doesn't have a lot of budget. Uh, it's hard to get executive buy-in, particularly if you report into a very cost-sensitive CFO. It can be tr super tricky. Um, both budget and executive buy-in tend to come from the challenge of, you know, honestly making a strong business case. Um, and just one piece of advice here, I suggest you just do your own due diligence on more than one vendor. Um, oftentimes, budget and executive buy-in requires a thorough RFP, pricing negotiation amongst multiple vendors. A lot of this also just goes into what type of culture you're stepping into in your organization. Um, much of this type of exec buy-in and budget, you know, could also be discussed with the hiring manager before you join a company um, to assess what this, you know, you know, what I call the cultural and budgetary landscape of your role is gonna be, and depending on how senior of a position you're in and your expected mandate to the company and the team. And so with that, I mentioned earlier, our HR tech survey is still open, the link's here. If you want to copy the results, we've got a lot more with this survey that we are not showcasing um, or debating here today. We just simply don't have time. Um, but one of the things also coming up next, we are running a mental health survey, which is going to be really important for May for Mental Health Month. So I, I strong, strongly urge everyone to um, participate and share your thoughts. And without further ado, I'll hand over the reins back over to our uh, illustrious crew here. My part today was the easiest part. Randy, Sarah, and Mimi, deep bows to all of you for being a part of our ongoing HR debate community. Um, and we really do appreciate your contribution to the discussion today. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, thank you for contributing as well. I know everyone found that just as informational and awesome as I did. Um, so let's dive on in. 
Um, our first question is employer versus employee experience. Which one takes precedence? So I'll say when I was interviewing with recently, I was actually asked this question quite a bit, and I found that the companies I was meeting with were 50-50 on this topic. So I'm going to say agnostic. Mimi, would you like to make the case for employees? Sure, happy to do so. Um, I think I had mentioned earlier in the intro that when we went through our more recent RFP experience, uh, we focus very, very closely on our nurse experience. So I want to start it off by saying, you know, don't lose track of your mission, your vision, and your values as an organization when you're heading into a technology RFP. Sometimes you're focusing in on the problems, right? And kind of to piggyback on what uh, Aaron had said right at the kickoff of that survey, you want to make sure that you're not losing track and just focusing in on just the problems. You got to think about what's the happy stuff too, right? So I'm a huge proponent of trimming down your RFP, looking at that traditional RFP and making it more precise, moving it into a more scorecard model so that you can make it measurable and also um, like consistently measurable as you're looking across different uh, potential vendor and systems, et cetera. And ensuring that your employee experience is included at the initiation of your RFP or your scorecard approach. Um, I feel like so many organizations try to focus in on that internal stakeholder needs, like we need this feature, we need this function, we wanna make sure that our day-to-day -day is moving swiftly. And I totally agree, you absolutely need to focus in on that, um, but don't wait to address that employee experience because if you slap it on at the end, then you've lost a lot of time. You got to go backwards and then reconsider certain things because maybe you found something that's perfect for your internal stakeholders, but then you forgot about this one feature and functionality for one of your groups of employees that are remote, for example, right? So really look critically at your RFP, trim it down, make sure it's measurable, and ensure that your employee experience is included at the get-go so that you don't lose track of it and that you have the right rating in your decision matrix for that employee experience. And it doesn't have to just be one lump of like, is this a great employee experience? Break it out. Break it out into what it is that they're gonna be doing in each of the systems that you're looking to uh, go to market for. And make sure you're hitting each one of those um, and giving them the right equal weight against the other pieces of your RFP or of your stakeholder, uh, your scorecard. Um, one other thing too is, you know, I was looking at that little pie chart about, uh, you know, employee versus employer and uh, self-service is a huge piece of that RFP too, right? Because if your employees have a great experience and they can navigate the systems really well and find the answers to those questions, then that's gonna organically give you and your internal teams a lot of time back. Uh, so don't forget about that employee experience, make them happy, make it easy for them, and then you can still find the features and functionalities that you need um, in the systems and technology of your choice. Wonderful, thank you, Mimi. And that's Sarah, all I got. Your, yeah, sure. That was awesome. I really loved hearing all of your, your insights there. Um, Sarah, what are your thoughts and insights from the employer side? Uh, I think it's a tough question. Most, I feel like most HR professionals would say that the employee experience always takes precedence. So I'm um, surprised a little bit at the uh, survey results, but I firmly believe that by focusing on utilizing technology to streamline processes, you can uh, provide a really efficient employer experience, and that is what will allow you the time to really focus on the employee experience outside of your tech world. At one point in my career, I was performing a lot of data entry, and it was really a valuable lesson to see how much actual time you can save in the aggregate by having a system that can do more with fewer clicks or load five seconds faster on every transaction. It's all about efficiency. We were focused on minimizing the number of keystrokes needed to complete those tasks. And it also really depends on the complexity of your organization and your workforce and the resources available to you and your team, right? Technology allows us to duplicate ourselves to scale and to provide the educational experience to the employee that they would have if they were to talk to me face to face. 
except there's only one of me and there's 1,500 of my employees. The more an HR department is stretched thin, I agree, um, the more necessary it is for their technology to allow them to efficiently complete their administrative duties. We've come such a long way by focusing on being a real partner to our business leaders, and to do that, we can't be mired in administrative tasks. To Mimi's point, if your employees are only coming into a system to check their pay stubs for open enrollment, to update their employee data, if all they're utilizing is the employee self-service module, you should absolutely focus on the employer experience and software systems that allow you to perform your recruiting, payroll, compensation, and HRIS transactions in the most efficient way possible. Every minute that we save on administrative tasks is a minute that we can dedicate instead to soliciting employee feedback, planning programming, and executing on strategy. And that's where we can really add value to the organization and create a better employee experience. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Mimi, do you have any, anything for a rebuttal back towards what Sarah had said? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree uh, with what Sarah had said there. And I guess my one rebuttal would be just make sure you're adding that employee experience at the get-go, right? Um, so much gets lost and so much time could be wasted if you're not folding that in to how you're making your decisions at the beginning. Um, and when we talk about executive buy-in and just stakeholder buy-in, your employees are also a stakeholder, even if they're not sitting at the table. So just be aware, because if you make a decision and you haven't folded them in, and even if the back end working really well for the internal teams, uh, you might have a problem on your hands, right, once you roll that system out. So just be aware and make sure that that employee experience does not get lost in the rest of the requirements as you initiate your decision-making process. Great, yeah, Sarah. I agree. Yeah, I, I was just going to say I agree. Um, I think um, that a lot of the systems these days do, they've, they've created more of a consumer experience for the employee already from a self-service perspective. Um, so I think that, you know, the designers are really helping us um, make sure that, that that need is taken into account um, within the software. And, you know, I've, I've really noticed a difference in the software and how it's being presented, especially in the self-service model. Wonderful. Very so true. Now, yeah. Um, I'd like to pull the audience now, um, see how you guys feel. So employer versus employee experience, which one takes the precedence for you? We're launching it now. It will end in five seconds. So get your final votes in. Okay, so now we're going to share the results. And it's employee, just clear employee by a landslide. So, um, wow, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Cool. So we will now move to our second question, our second debate topic. Um, so uh, for, for the HR tech evaluation process, internal, meaning like peer reviews, talking to your colleagues, Slack channels, uh, versus external, which would be online reviews, sites such as G2. Um, I remember when I first started doing human resources, I didn't have the communities that I do now. It was really hard to find peers, but it was also just as hard to find information online and you also didn't know if that information was actu actually going to be accurate or not. Um, but now there's almost too much information from each side. So Sarah, would you like to take charge on the internal peer colleague side of things? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've, I've looked at a lot of technology. I try to go on tech uh, webinars fairly frequently and tech demos just to see what's out there and kind of keep a pulse on what might work for our organization. Obviously, there's so many um, solutions out there that it can be really daunting um, to try and narrow that down. One of the things that I've done in the past is um, really utilize um, LinkedIn 
um, and kind of gone about it in a creative way. Obviously, the um, software companies are usually not going to give you um, references that are, are going to speak ill of them. Um, so I don't always find a lot of value in talking to their provided resources, but um, you know, I've used LinkedIn to, find, to search for people who ha are using that software or state having experience with that software. Um, but it's also really important to make sure that you're looking at individuals or talking to individuals from an industry um, and com complexity and organization scope that's similar to yours. Um, a business with locations all in one state has very different needs than one in 19 states, uh, especially some of the more complicated states like California, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, so I really try and connect with HR professionals that are in my same industry and the same complexity. Um, and I, you know, develop a, a list of questions like I'm interviewing them um, to go through and, and try and be able to compare apples to apples. So how did they feel the implementation went? What additional costs did they incur that they hadn't anticipated? Where does the system perform better than expected? What does it not do that they wish it did? I always want to know, did it actually solve the top objectives for the project or did it fall short? And then how was the implementation for their stakeholders? And what made the big, biggest difference in communicating with those stakeholders? Or what would you do differently if they had to do it again? Um, so I try and get, you know, that very specific feedback. Um, and I do want to caution and say, you know, almost all of these vendors have multiple versions and multiple products out there. So it is really important to start off that conversation by, um, you know, having a short conversation, again, about your respective organizations, um, the specific version that you're on, the specific modules of that software that you're using so that you can really be sure that you're um, comparing apples to apples. And then, um, you know, I, I want to know about customer service and, and when they have a problem, how many touches does it take to get the right answer? I know that was one of my issues when I used to work with ADP Workforce Now. I could call five different times and get five different answers for the same problem. Um, so in my experience, online reviews can be useful, but they don't give you that same level of reference and specificity. Um, and so, you know, really talking to people and, and being able to dive into their answers. I really prefer to do this over the phone rather than just sending them a list of questions. Um, I ask a lot of questions. And so, um, you know, to me, it's so much more valuable to have that conversation over the, over the phone and be able to drill into things that you didn't know enough to know you needed to ask. Yeah, I agree with you on all of that. Um, Mimi, you want to take the reins and give the rebuttal for external? Your perspective. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, totally. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say reference back to your initial scorecard in your decision matrix, right? So um, again, if you have a really tight evaluation process. Um, then really start there with what you're looking for to ensure that you know all of your internal stakeholder requirements and your employee experience experience requirements um, are accurately measured as you go through your vetting process. I like to go with external first, uh, just because the landscape is constantly changing. Um, I do agree with Sarah that it's very important to find others um, in your space that have lived and breathed the technology that you're um, vetting and uh, you know, understanding each phase of that technology experience. But start with your external sources too, right? Because you know, looking at Captera or G2 and looking at what is now, not just what was, because things can change on a quarterly basis, sometimes even monthly. Um, it's hard to keep up with technology. It's a good thing that it's evolving so quickly. That means we're getting better, faster tools uh, for us and for our employees um, every step of the way, every other day. But it's also kind of hard to keep track of that. So uh, just ensure that you're looking at these up-to-date sources out there so that um, you're ensuring that you're looking at the right type of technology, um, the, the right version of the technology, and speak up after you've um, 
kind of trim down uh, your options to your top, you know, four or five based on the hard facts of what those external sources are saying. And when I say hard facts, I mean like, what are the true features and functionalities? What is connectivity for that system? And by connectivity, I mean, don't get blindsided by someone saying, hey, yeah, we're integrated. What does integration mean, right? So tr uh, trim it down using the facts that you've gotten from your external sources, and then speak up and ask for the right people to then have live discussions. Um, and by that, I mean, let's say you're looking at eight different technologies, and then you trim it down to four, your top four, based on those external evaluation resources, like a Captera or G2, um, and then, uh, you know, get on those demos, sure, but make sure you're speaking to the right people at those technology uh, places so that you're speaking with the SMEs, right, the subject matter experts for each of the modules so that you can dig in and get the facts um, over the phone. Um, let, me get, let me give you an example here too. Let's say you're evaluating HRIS, then admin and payroll. You're evaluating an all-in-one. Don't just sit on that demo with a salesperson. And I love sales folks, don't get me wrong. Um, but make sure you're asking them, hey, I have specific questions that have come out of my initial evaluation and here's my scorecard like share it with them and be like, here are all of my nitty gritty things that I'm looking for. And this is where I'm kind of ranking you right now. Like prove me wrong, get me on a call with an HRIS person and let me loop in my HRIS partner. Or if you're the only one, then you gotta do it. And then let me see someone on Ben Admin because I have a specific question about this Ben Admin feature and function. And then let me bring my payroll person in and I wanna sit on a demo with your payroll SME because we have specific questions about how Pennsylvania taxation, blah, blah, blah. You know, get your right people on the phone so that you can get the right feedback and the right details. And then ensure you're asking hard questions. And don't let folks get by with a, well, let me get back to you on that. And if they say, well, let me get back to you on that, give them a deadline and a due date because you're controlling the process and you want to get the hard facts. Um, so starting with those external sources and getting the right external sources on the phone to then evaluate what you found in your research, uh, I think is the best way to do it. Wonderful. That was, where were you at when I was first starting to do HR? You ladies have been giving us such great wisdom. Uh, Sarah, now it's actually rebuttal time. Sarah, would you like to do a rebuttal? Uh, sure. You know, I think, um, Mimi, those are really great points. I especially like the point about the implementation specialists and really, um, you know, not just having the conversation with the salespeople. Um, you know, and in my experience, I've generally found that if they can't tell you how the software meets that need immediately, it generally just can't do it. Um, we've asked very specific questions <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, well, it just, it does it. You'll see. Well, you'll see, uh, never works out. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I think um, <laughs> one thing I would add is, you know, when you're when you're talking to your sources, um, especially again back with the peer review groups, um, I think a really important question that I forgot to mention was it's it's so important to ask the person you're talking to, did they inherit that system or did they implement the system? And if they implemented it, when was it? Again, to Mimi's point, things are changing so so quickly. You, you know, you may be talking to someone who has a terrible experience with a software and it's because whoever implemented it previous to them didn't do a great job or didn't understand all the requirements or I think the most common answer is just they were absolutely pressed for time and just had to get it done, right? And, and sometimes that results in not investigating every piece of the setup as closely as, um, as you should. So I think that, you know, making sure to ask those questions um, can really help you understand um, if you're going to run into those same issues or if, if they're inherent to the current process of implementing or if it's something that you no longer need to worry about. Wonderful. And Mimi, do you have some final thoughts? 
Um, just yes, absolutely. Implementation always trickles down to your day to day. <laughs> I'm sure everyone has lived a little piece of that. Um, and again, just when you're on those external evaluation sources, uh, ask folks like share share your implementation with me. Uh, how did that go? And then once you're on a demo or a call with that implementation specialist uh, at the technology vendor of your choice ask them to share their implementation timeline and project plan with you. Um, ask those hard questions and get it straight from them uh, so that you're not making assumptions, but you're making a really nice decision based on the facts that you've accumulated. Great, and so now we're gonna poll the audience. We're gonna launch the polling on HR tech evaluation process, internal versus external. And the polls have been launched. We're just going to keep pulling for a couple, a little bit longer. Okay, and we're ending the polling now. And internal won 71% versus 29% for external. Um, before we go into the, the next question, I just want to remind everybody, if you do have um, a question that you'd like to submit after the next two questions are done, if we have the time, please do send it over. We would love to add it in. Uh, go to the QA button at the top of your screen. So moving on now to our third topic, um, HR tools, best in breed versus all in one. I'll say from my experience, I've had some pretty big promises by some all-in-ones and was really excited when we were implementing them and then it just, you know, three to six months later, they didn't deliver. However, you know, I've also been on the other side of the coin where uh, we had best of breed, there were a lot of different systems, one for everything from performance management to uh, you name it, we had it. So. Um, I don't want to drop any names there. So, but anyway, um, I, what I found with, with having the best of, bead, best of breed, sorry, was that there were so many logins that I was still being asked a bunch of questions and people just weren't utilizing all the different, the different platforms that we had for them. So, um, you know, each of them have their flaws and each have their strengths. So Mimi, you want to give us a little bit on best in breed and your thoughts there? Sure. Um, so I, yeah, I'd be happy to argue best in breed. Um, you know, I think again, as the broken record that I am, that scorecard, <laughs> again, you should make a decision <laughs> based on what your requirements are, right? So don't get blindsided by an all-in-one because it sounds jazzy and they promise you that it's all going to be streamlined and everyone just logs in once and everything is working beautifully, right? Make sure you're looking at your requirements and see if that all-in-one really does satisfy all of those requirements. Sometimes they really just don't. So I'm just a proponent of finding the technology that you need to satisfy those requirements. Um, at the same time, of course, you need to keep in mind how many implementations are you ready for? If you choose four different point solutions, you're gonna do four implementations. That said, you can also get really, really strategic on the timing of your implementation. So maybe you do need all of those systems because you just have all of these multiple requirements and an all-in-one is just not gonna satisfy it. Then think about how you could stagger your implementations. Um, for a payroll example, uh, we just went through one, right? We had to go through a year-end cutover. So I wasn't going to be able to do a performance management system and an ATS at the same time, right? So I focused on that payroll implementation and then started layering in the rest of the implementations that we would need into the rest of the calendar year, the new calendar year. So think critically about that and think critically about your resources. I say that because if you do have internal engineering resources, you can make connectivity work. And again, with the changing landscape and, uh, you know, just technology and HR tech, um, but technology in general, there are way more options now for connectivity and point solutions know that they have to keep up. Otherwise, they're going to be left behind. So ask them what connectivity looks like for them. And you might get surprised 
there's a ton of new marketplace solutions out there too that kind of, um, I'm doing air quotes, uh, have that plug and play type of model, right? So ask them about their marketplace, ask them about what's coming in their marketplace and don't make that decision just based on what you thought you knew on uh, those best in breeds, right? Um, and then lastly, um, if you, you know, if you can manage the connectivity on the back end, then you can also potentially solve for that employee experience uh, by layering on all sorts of um, other solutions to enhance that, like, uh, like an Okta, for example, right? Uh, a single sign-on type of um, uh, provisioning and deprovisioning type of uh, solution. Uh, there are a couple of other ones out there, um, but see what you could do to still get the same experience of an all-in-one, but still have the high performance um, uh, of the best in breed to match all of your requirements. Wonderful. Sarah, would you like to give us your perspective? Sure. So I think, um, you know, the all-in-one is really the dream, right? We, we really, um, it can be so hard to find a system that can adequately transfer the data. Um, and that's what I find most with the best of breeds. While they do have APIs, you know, sometimes they're not true 360 APIs um, allowing you like true data integration. Sometimes they'll only push data. Sometimes they'll only receive data. And sometimes they won't even sh uh, be able to send all of the fields that they're collecting. Um, we did a, uh, not here at SunPower, but I previously did an implementation of an onboarding platform that's very sophisticated. But when the employee fills out all of their employee data, it populates into PDFs. And then there's no way to get that data back out of the system. They didn't even have a built-in .csv download or something like that, which just completely blew my mind. Because why would you ever create a software where you don't at least have a way to get the data back out? So that's uh, one of the questions that I always love to ask my vendors is, so if I decide to move away from you in five years, how do I get my data back? Um, because it's actually more tricky than you think. Um, but, you know, really, there's so much complexity when you're using best of breed, especially if you are a um, small HR team, you really just need it to work because something that doesn't work, if the data is not transferring, it's almost useless. And you end up having to do duplicate data entry or there you, you introduce um, so much possible error into the data that's being brought into your system or might be treated in different ways. Um, you know, we need tools that can provide data in a relational way so that we can draw actionable insights that can drive our decision making. It's hard to be able to see the whole story of what's really happening in your organization if you can't see your demographic data, your salary data, your promotion and performance data, your turnover data at the same time. Yes, you can pull reports out of multiple systems and try and cobble them together. And you may be lucky enough to have an analyst or a data visual visualization software uh, to help with that. But in a lot of organizations that I've worked in, all those reports have to be rebuilt every time you get someone new in that role because they can't figure out how to make changes to something they didn't create uh, since it was built with a logic that wasn't their own. Uh, how you're going to you know, how are you going to know which recruiting sources uh, actually result in hiring the best performers if you can't see that data in a relational way? So I think that, um, you know, I, I would say that the, the benefit, obviously, of having all the data in one place is that hopefully you can use it all to be relational. Um, and I, I do have to say, you know, in the all-in-one, they're all modular, so you can still integrate or you can still implement them in um, kind of a phased fashion. So uh, from what I've seen, usually you would go live on core, which is your HIS payroll and benefits. Um, and then separately, you could go live on recruiting, uh, live on performance management, live on compensation. Um, and, and now a lot of them are throwing in, um, you know, various data um, analysis. Uh, either from an AI perspective or or not. Um, so I think you still have that option if you're going with an all-in-one. Um, and then I'd also say too, something to keep in mind, in best of breed, 
the security permissions that you have to manage, even just in an all-in-one, the security <laughs> permissions that you have to manage for even a medium-sized organization just become unwieldy. Um, and so I would just say, you know, keep that in mind when you're looking at best of breed um, is, are you going to have to build all of these other systems and to cobble the information together? And then you're still going to have to deal with, well, Joe has access in the recruiting software, but he doesn't have access in the onboarding software. Um, and, and trying to make that all work and keep it up to date, our, our organizations change so quickly. We're all so um, um, just trying to you know, move ahead at the speed of light that it's almost impossible to keep those security permissions and uh, access all up to date. So I think that an all-in-one really gives you the best shot to do that. Um, and I would also mention that, you know, there's new data privacy laws that are being written, um, the ones that are going to be coming out or are coming out in California. Um, and so moving that data around may become more and more restricted. And so if you're able to keep it all in one place, in one software solution, I think that you'll be better served um, as these laws develop and as we figure out how restrictive they're going to be. Wonderful. Um, those were some great points about your about the data and getting it back. I don't think I've ever had that experience with the PDF, so it's really good to know that that is something that could happen. Uh, Mimi, would you like to give a rebuttal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, PDFs. Why, who, who does data in a PDF? Um, but <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I would just say that <laughs> make sure you have all of those critical points that Sarah just mentioned on your scorecard because yes, absolutely. Ask about SOC security. Ask about how their data is going to move. Ask about how reporting is going to look for you and your team. Um, make sure you understand what provisioning looks like and deprovisioning looks like. Make sure you understand what burden you're going to have even if you do have internal engineering resources that can help you with the connectivity uh, if the systems of your choice don't offer those services, um, right? And make sure you know what that timeline is going to look like. Maybe you're okay with a burden of manual dual or triple entry for a month uh, or two months or three months even because the best of breed solutions are still hitting the ball out of the park on the features and functionalities that you're looking for. So. I'm more arguing that like the transparency in your decision making so that you know what you're getting into. And if it's still pointing to the you know, direction of best of breed, then go with best of breed. Um, but then don't complain when you got to do that dual entry because you signed up for it, right? Um, now, one other thing I'm going to say is get the right people on the call. It's okay to also say to your you know, top three vendors of choice, I really want to explore all of the promises that you're making to me for this API or for this batch process and SFTP or whatever. All three of you are soft security certified and blah, 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 blah. You're hitting all the marks. Let's get on a call. I want to talk to your integration specialist and I want you guys to walk me through what that's going to look like in the next month or two months or three months so that you can get a little bit of a peek into the future and start your own mental project planning and know what you're getting into before you sign that sales order. Wonderful. All right, so the takeaway here, scorecard. Oh, for, um, sorry, Sarah, your final thoughts. I'm so sorry, I'm jumping the gun. I'm so excited about <laughs> oh, that. Oh, no place. worries. So much good stuff. Sorry, um, Sarah, you go. Yeah, no, I think um, in relation to this, just, you know, again, in all aspects of HR, we have to, you know, take into account um, how our organization runs, the complexity, um, the the unknowable future. Um, and, you know, from, from my perspective, I think you can best um, prepare for those things in an all-in-one um, since, you know, you know, it, it kind of limits how much that you're looking at at any given moment um, and, and puts some blinders on, which, you know, can be um, a little, like I said, a little bit limiting, but it also gives you the freedom to really explore how do you get the most from your one solution. I would say that um, the, the module that I see people um, do separately as the best of breed most often is recruiting, just because it is so critical 
for your recruiters to be able to move through those candidates, manage those requisitions, be able to assign um, communication ability or not to managers, to various um, you know, parts of your organization. So I would say, you know, if you're in an all-in-one right now, um, the chances are that the weakest link is your recruiting software, and that may be the one that you want to look at first if you're going to investigate a best of breed. Wonderful. So I'm going to pull the, we're going to pull the audience now. Again, HR tools, best in breed versus all in one it is uh, in progress now. And now I'll say the takeaway, score cars and get your data back. Those are the two big things. Um, so we're just going to give it a couple more seconds. Okay, just a couple more. Okay, so the results are in, and it was pretty fairly close, especially compared to the last poll. So all in one got 58%, and best of breed got 42%. Okay, so uh, now we're going to move on to our fourth and final question. Um, and if we have time, we will um, go with our crowdsource questions as well. Uh, so question four, who makes the decision on payroll tech? Is it HR or is it finance? Um, I'll say real quick that the companies I worked for in New York, um, I usually reported to the CFO and then lightly reported to the CEO. Um, so I always had my, my finger on the pulse of the budget and I was always lucky enough to work with a CFO that was open to all of my ideas and gave me the budget that I wanted. Um, you know, but it, HR does need to be comfortable with the systems, but, you know, finance holds the pocketbook. Finance is sometimes the one running accounting and payroll, and sometimes it is HR, so it can make it really tricky. Um, Sarah, would you like to start and argue um, on behalf of why it should be the HR person? Yes, I think it really depends on um, the distinction of how does your organization see finance um, versus accounting, and how do they define those roles? Um, payroll is a hard and thankless job. Um, and as I've progressed in my HR career, it's something that's tricky because, you know, I started in payroll and it's so complicated. Um, but from my past experiences, not including SunPower, you know, I would say that Finance is not the right organization. Um, they may be from like just the data perspective, but I actually really feel that um, while HR should make the final decision on payroll tech, it should actually, payroll itself should actually be run by accounting um, because finance is doing um, all of the budgeting and the forecasting um, and they may be reporting on the taxes, but it's really um, the link between payroll and accounting where those, where um, all of that data actually hits your financials. And that's what needs to be really, really clean, right? You need it to have been um, allocated properly. You need the coding to be correct. You need your earnings and your deductions going to the right place. So I would say actually that payroll actually belongs in accounting, but I would say again that the decision on payroll tech really I think should lie with HR because from my experience, and it may be different in other places, but from my experience, um, employees always come to HR first with any of their questions. Um, and we hold so much of the um, responsibility of explaining how all of these different laws and leave policies and time and attendance and leave of absence and short-term disability, how does all of that fit together? And then how do we as HR communicate that to payroll on a um, real-time enough basis that payroll can actually process what needs to happen and you're not constantly making adjustments afterwards. Um, you know, that's something that I'm looking at right now is I'm trying to figure out, you know, can paid parental leave work from a payroll perspective when you're not getting so many pieces of information in real time that would allow you to know if you're paying, if you're just topping someone up or if you're actually now paying them over the 100% they would have earned if they were, um, you know, here uh, at work. 
So I think that, um, you know, another um, consideration is that finance may not always um, give it the support it deserves. They, they have very specific priorities and payroll is not a planning and budgeting piece of that puzzle. It's an actual piece of that puzzle. And so a lot of times when I have seen it under finance in other organizations, I've seen it, um, you know, kind of be understaffed and underfunded. And that's usually just a recipe for disaster. Um, because there's a lot of things as you look at your growth at, at your organization um, that you may not know at the time you set it up, but that architecture is going to drive your entire payroll process. Uh, for the rest of time, like you almost can't re-engineer it. Um, I know, you know, if you set up new FEINs, that's going to cause your employees who move from one FEIN to another, usually they're going to need, you know, ACA reporting under each of those separate FEINs. You're going to need different W-2s under each of those FEINs. And from payroll's perspective, you may just be moving heads from one bucket to another bucket, and they may not realize all the downstream implications of what happens after that. Um, so I would say, um, again, I don't think that payroll processing necessarily belongs in HR, but if we have to explain how something is going to be paid to an employee, we should at least have access to the system and have say into uh, the technology. Awesome. Thank you for all of that, Sarah. Um, Mimi, what's, what's your take on on the whole HR and finance debate. Yeah, it's hard to follow that. Um, I would say don't lose track of your finance though. I think you know finance really needs to be um, part of that decision. Um, so much does then trickle down into your financials and and if we're not considering the fintech that is already existing or uh, maybe you're going out to market for new financial software systems as well, then if that data coming from HR and payroll doesn't fit in with your new fintech, then that's not going to work, right? And then finance is going to come find you. And then you're going to be the one that potentially has to help them with manual data manipulation to get them what they need so that they can close their books. So although the internal stakeholders that run payroll and run HR do need to live and breathe in those systems to ensure that the data from HR and into payroll is consistent and accurate. Um, if, you're, if you're leaving finance out of the picture there and they're not part of that decision-making process, um, then you're gonna also have a potential data nightmare further down the stream. And finance is also the one that if you can get their buy-in, maybe you can also get a little bit more of that budget so that you're making a collective decision across all uh, of these stakeholders and you can then land on uh, the best decisions across all of your technology for that back office finance hr uh, payroll um, and then one other thing too is um, you know not to kind of blend in the all-in-one solution piece but you know sometimes those all-in-ones you can get bundled deals or something right like your salesperson might say hey if you go with you know, all, all HRIS payroll, um, Ben Admin with us, you're gonna, I'm gonna knock off 10 grand, whatever it might be. If you don't loop in finance in the decision-making process there, you might be making a decision in a silo based on your cost and budgeting at the initiation. And if you have finance in the mix, you might actually be able to get better technology and more budget because you're also considering what your financial partners are gonna need downstream, right? Um, so don't lose track of that finance arm and make sure you're meeting their features, functionalities, and data needs and you're involving them at the beginning of your decision making. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is finance isn't going to make the 100% decision here, but they should have a very heavy weight in this and an equal weight uh, so that you're making a collective decision and everyone's walking away happy and on the same page of the decision so that you're not being blindsided later down the line. I totally One agree. Other I think that I'm going to say. Oh, sorry, is, keep going. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say um, to echo Sarah, it also kind of depends on your size and your industry, right? 
So if you're a small seed startup, your decision making is going to definitely include your finance team. And then if, when you get larger, um, just make sure that you're not you're you're not you know operating in that silo as you're making your decision. Um, and if you're you know also integrating multiple types of financial technologies, um, make sure that you know what systems need to connect to what and where data is going and where data is coming back. Um, yeah. Great. So we are almost at the top of the hour. Um, so do either either of you have a time for a quick rebuttal real quick, Sarah or Mimi? I know you both had some really amazing wisdom there. Um, Sarah? Sarah, I think I would just um, really quickly say um, no matter who owns the software, absolutely HR, finance, accounting should all be in the room. Um, I think that you know HR is really the protector of the employee experience. Um, and so um, I would also say too that make sure that any payroll system that you're using currently or that you're looking at um, has a general ledger interface because your accounting department will love you, your finance uh, department will love you. Um, it will make things so much easier um, if you sit, set that up. It's uh, usually referred to as a GLI and it is just, it's invaluable once you set it up how much smoother things run and allocations are made and data flows um, to, your, to your financials and to the proper GL accounts. Wonderful. Mimi? Totally, no. totally agree. That GL interface is super important. Um, and going back to a point of getting everybody on the right call, when you're talking through implementation, bring in your accounting and finance and ask them what they're going to need uh, for that GL. Make sure that it's getting implemented and coded in the right way uh, so that you're making the best use of your implementation phase. Great. And so we're going to pull the audience now. So who makes the decision on payroll tech, HR, or finance? And we're just going to give it a couple of seconds. We have two minutes left. So as soon as the poll is over, uh, we will wrap things up. So just give us a few more seconds on the polling. Okay. Great. And so the results are in. It's 66% HR and 34% finance. Um, I know I learned a lot today from both Mimi and Sarah, and I hope both everyone out there did as well. I want to say thank you to Erin for sharing the results, and a huge thank you to you guys. Mimi and Sarah, you guys really made this debate super lively and informative, and I learned so much from both of you. Um, so I'd like to just hand it to you first, Mimi, to say goodbye, and then Sarah, you after. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. That was a lot of fun. Um, if anyone is curious about scorecards, <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to share further. <laughs> and thank you uh, from my perspective um, to everybody who took the time to join us today. I know if you're as busy as I am, um, it's almost impossible, but I can only encourage you to go more, uh, to more webinars, um, listen to more podcasts. I cannot tell you how much that has helped my career and my understanding um, and, and seeing the bigger picture, the, the strategic picture. So thank you for joining us. Great. And a huge thank you to everybody that participated in the webinar and helped us get our polling results during the webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to email benefits at loody.com. And it's noon, so I'll let you all go. Thank you. Bye-bye.